Bear Down Bears fans, another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast coming your way. Marvin Harrison Jr. may be tanking his draft stock. Reports are out there. We'll see what it really all means as we have Courtney Cronin on with us as well. Also, got to look at some of the player comparisons that are out there. Some of the guys that the Bears are attached to have some interesting comps per Matt Miller based on who they play like. Want to get into that as well. And uh, listen. It's not all gloom and doom in Chicago. We've got Caleb Williams coming here. Uh, We've got uh, whoever we're going to take at nine. We got Connor Bedard. We got Angel Reese and Camilla Cardoza. Woo! The sky did something yesterday. We got to talk about that. All that more on today's episode of the Chicago Bears podcast. Hit that like button. Subscribe to the page. Leave a five-star review. Y'all know what to do. Courtney, how are you? I'm good. And for those watching on who for those who have the video component of this podcast they could see me rolling my eyes and looking exasperated maybe is the word that i i would use there when you were talking about the marvin harrison jr rumor that's floating yeah, out yeah, there yeah. if you want to call it that i don't know how yeah. much how many legs i mean how strong of what, legs what, this thing what has is the word report right like I, like it is i wouldn't even call it a reporting report. this I like no but i wouldn't call it a report because okay. the way that i look at this and here i'm gonna let you break down what was said verbatim because i know you have the notes in front of you yeah, yeah, yeah. this is it, it's how many days are we till draft we are nine, nine days, days away, away. And this came out, I believe, 10 days. So it was yesterday on Monday where we hear, hey, Marvin Harrison Jr. wants to go to Chicago. He might be in a position to force his way into that happening somehow. And again, this came from one person, one sourced report, uh, one source that was telling this guy this. It doesn't seem to have a lot of traction nationally, but I will let you take it away here and you can explain um, for those who are listening without seeing the screen right now and seeing the quote, what is said. Yeah, so we've got, I mean, uh, this is Joey Christopoulos. He, he's talking about MHJ, covers the Big Ten um, for Beyond the Big Ten. Um, he, from what I can tell, this is a guy who is, you know, he, he's not just the guy saying things things i guess about you know guys in the big 10 he does cover them he is in press conferences he is talking to people but i don't know if they're i I question some of the validity here because of what is said uh he goes on to say i've talked to a few people and i've tried to get it confirmed at the time marvin harrison was blowing off his pro day he was just not showing up What I've kind of been told, and this is not confirmed, is that Harrison wants to play for the Chicago Bears. He also goes on to, oh, wrong way. There we go. He also goes on to talk about, I'm not saying he'll fall to nine, but if JJ goes at four, I think there could be a deal with the Chargers at five. The clause is pro, or the, uh, um, Clause is probably going to be next year's Panthers second round pick or the Bears own second round pick, which I guess we've kind of heard that if there was a move, right? I guess the the one validity part to that is that that Panthers second round pick could be a part of a trade if the Bears were to move up. But outside of that, what are your thoughts on this I, I guess rumor? Mm-hmm. Like he's not confirming anything, so report that there is some belief that Marvin Harrison was tanking his draft days and his pro days to try and get to Chicago to be with Caleb Williams. I'll start here. First off, I have said this on this pod and I've said it on radio. I don't believe they're going to move up for a receiver. I believe that what would be in play at number nine, most likely is them moving back if they're going to make any move at all. And depending upon how those quarterbacks come off the board. And today we hear that Washington is having all the top quarterbacks, not named Caleb Williams, because he took one visit and that was to Chicago, but J.J. McCarthy, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, they're all in the building in Washington today. J.J. McCarthy and Drake May believe we're meeting with the Patriots in yeah. within the last 48 hours. So there's a lot that is still being decided for Washington, who then has the ability to, to, to change the draft order. If they go J.J. McCarthy there at number two, then it's Jaden Daniels potentially, then it's Drake May or Drake May, Jaden Daniels, like whatever it is. If by the time a team gets to the Chargers at five and the first receiver is about to go off the board, 
Chargers may stay there and take a receiver, or they may be looking to, uh, you know, take a team that wants to come up to go get a receiver. But why wouldn't they take Marvin Harrison Jr. Right. if he's sitting right there at five? I don't believe the offensive line's been a, a position that's been mocked to them all that often, or in many of the frequent simulations that we've seen. So, how the draft order is affected is kind of like by the quarterbacks and where they go is what I'm focusing on right now. And I don't know. Every year we do this exercise. We did it last year thinking it was going to go one through four quarterbacks. We saw, you know, one, one, two, and then four for quarterbacks. And then Will Levis not going until the second round. But I'm just not convinced at the moment that it is going to be one through four within the quarterback order and that a receiver might be going somewhere in there, possibly at four to the Cardinals. So it brings me back to like now that that's out of the way of thinking right. BC brought up, like what, what f- would feel realistic potentially would be the bears maybe going up to five to go get him in this simulation. Now that that's out of the way, a couple things on the, on how this was presented. I, I understand that like we're in an era now where to be a reporter, to be a source journalist, doesn't mean that you have to work at a massive network at a massive newspaper, massive outlet, whatever it is. People have sources that come at all different levels of of media. This guy is a podcaster, I believe, from the Believe Network. Um, Just like from seeing, I I had not heard of him before this. So I I went and looked at at what his Twitter handle was, where, what his social media presence on X was, all of those things. And I just don't like how it was presented where I can't confirm this, but I'm hearing this. I think that's the tricky, that's like the the slippery slope we get into with podcasts where we're in a format where it's not going on sports center and you've got 90 seconds to report everything that you know with the most important nugget up first sourced information and then the layers of it that tell the story. When you're on a podcast and you're in a free flowing medium where you have an, you know, kind of endless amount of time to talk about a certain subject, you can talk about things in a way that feel more comfortable and feel more conversational where, oh, look, I'm hearing this. I was told this. I can't, you know, tell you if it's completely fact, but I was told this. And that's where we've gotten within this conversation right now about how do you actually report something? I feel like this is a Mm -hmm. chance to kind of have a referendum on draft reporting, especially right now when we're nine days away. And it becomes rumor season where the draft yes. order sometimes changes. We've seen this, not just this year, but we've seen it in previous years where information comes out that might make a prospect skyrocket or might make a pri- prospect tank a couple spots or fall a couple spots. Of course, you know, the most infamous example of this was Laramie Tunzel in 2016 when <laughs> the bong video comes out and like while like teams are getting ready to like go like start the draft and that makes him fall from the top of the draft order to Miami and cost him millions of dollars in the process. There's an example that's like as extreme as that. And then in 2018, we all thought Sam Darnold was going to be the number one overall pick or Josh Allen that year quarterback. And within like the final 24 hours before the draft, it starts leaking out. Oh, Baker Mayfield's probably that guy going to Cleveland. and, And he does. And there's other examples of it that aren't like, among the top, top, top prospects in the draft. But the fact that this is coming from from one person, from one place, from somebody who I'm not claiming he's not sourced, I'm not claiming that this is just a one-off, but he said like he's been trying to confirm it. So he clearly heard it from one place, but doesn't have the sourcing needed to concretely say, I know this as fact. So when you're throwing something out there about a prospect and an accusation more or less that he wants to go to the bears and that's why he's like tanking his draft stock to do so. That's a pretty, you better be sure you're right on that before you throw something like that out there. Is, is it a possibility Marvin Harrison wants to play in Chicago? Sure. But let's think about this realistically. And I've got the rookie wage scale. I'm going to pull up right now on my computer so I can go through the numbers. So if he's the first receiver taken off the board, let's say the quarterback order is one, two, and three. So by the time the Arizona Cardinals are on the clock at four, the total value of that contract, Pat, is $35,374,742. Signing bonus Mm. is 22.5-ish million. That's all guaranteed money. Um, 
let's say he's he that's that's like the best he can possibly do because I just don't think one through three, unless the Patriots trade out and do something else, that that would end up being a spot where a wide receiver goes. So like the highest he could in this situation, the highest he could go would be four. Let's say he goes to five, excuse me, to, to nine. That contract where the Bears are at nine goes from $35.4 million to the total value $22.7 million with a signing bonus that is about – 35 to 40% less than what he could make if he was the first receiver taken off the board. Why on earth would he want to do that? Why on earth would he want to do that? He'd be going to a place anyways. Like there might be teams that guys always dream of going to, but you can't control where you're drafted by and large. Right. I know that there's been the conversation about, you know, even Eli, Caleb, Manning. Eli Manning, Caleb Williams, <laughs> yeah. all this stuff, but you go to a place, you go to the place where you're drafted and the Cardinals wouldn't be a bad spot for him by any stretch. And we haven't heard him say any of this. Remember the one chance he had to talk, he decided he didn't want to. So he skipped out on his media availability at the combine. So we didn't get to hear from him about why are you not testing? Why are you not doing any of the workouts? He went there to like get weighed, get measured. And then I think he left. And then he didn't do his stuff at the pro day because that points to, I know I am the best receiver in this draft class. I don't have to do those other things because I know yes. I'm going within the top five. So all of it, it just, if you're doing logic here, applying logic to this, why would he take his own draft stock to earn about a third less than what he'd be making on his rookie contract? And if you do well in your rookie contract, that sets you up for a massive second rookie second contract. And we're seeing what these what these wide receiver contracts are now. Like this just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me why he would want to. And again, we have not heard this from him. This is just speculation yes. from from one reporter. This isn't a report that has a bunch of legs to it, or, or I guess heavy legs to it that is starting to get traction. It's an idea that's being floated out there based on what somebody allegedly heard. And I just think we need to be a little bit more careful in what we're reporting as journalists and as people who claim to be in that same space. Like there's a responsibility that comes with how you handle what you hear and being able to verify it before you let it out of your mouth. Like you may be hearing something. One of the best things I've ever heard. I know I'm going like on my like capital J no, journalist I love I love rant it. right now. One of the best things I ever heard was we know about I heard this from somebody like I, who, you know, I, I was a, was a source of mine in an NFL team at one point. And they told me, you know, about 10, like what's reported is about 10% of what actually goes on within teams. And what I have always been told is that you will be able to report. There'll be about 90% of what you hear and what you know that you will not be able to report for a number of reasons, but you might get something off the record that is completely off the record, not on background, you might get something that only has one source and you can't verify it. The fact that this information wasn't, wow, multiple people are telling me, and yeah. I can confirm via multiple sources close to Marvin Harrison Jr. that he wants to go to Chicago, that he's going to do what it takes to get there. Like, You just have to take the stuff with a grain of salt. Could this end up being true? It really doesn't, he doesn't have the, he doesn't have the power to make that happen. It would have to be right. based on the other teams. And if the bears wanted to move up to go get him, and we know that they did host him on a top 30 visit in April. So very clearly they did their homework on him along with Malik neighbors, along with Xavier worthy, along with Roma Dunze. But I, I just want to caution people because this stuff comes out in droves during the week of the draft and in the days leading up to it, that we just need to be mindful of, where it's coming from and if it actually has any, any weight behind any of the speculation. A hundred percent. I, I agree with everything that you said there. I think that it's, it, for me, this is kind of, we could break this down into, into two different things, right? One, where the report comes from, uh, uh, um, who reported it, all of that. He may be hearing this. And, and listen, sure. I, and, like, I, and I'm not saying he's not, but like the way that right. he reported saying, I'm trying to confirm this, like you're it kind felt of putting, washing your hands of it. Well, you're putting cart before the horse there before actually doing the real work to find out if this is true or not. Right. And and that's the thing. I'm not denying that he's hearing these things, that maybe somebody has told him this. I think what a lot of where a lot of people's concern and confusion comes in is, all right, who is that? Because remember before Caleb Williams spoke, 
we're hearing from Colin Cowherd. We're mm-hmm. hearing from right all of these other people about the camp of Caleb Williams or Caleb Williams' dad told me this on a side conversation and we're hearing all this stuff. And then Caleb goes up there and he's like, I've never, like, I don't even know what half of that stuff is about. Like, I, right, so mm-hmm. we didn't get to hear Marvin clear this up. Marvin probably has no idea that this is even out there, right? <laughs> like, if we're being 100% I'm, I'm honest. I'm sure he does. I'm sure, look, a lot of these people, they may not... They, these prospects, when you are a top draft prospect, I think that Caleb Williams, bringing him kind of into this, the team he has around him, that's becoming yeah. more and more the norm for these athletes coming out of the NIL era where they already have a lawyer, they've already got a marketing person, they've already got somebody, hand, like kind of their brand manager more or less. And all those people are keeping an eye on what's being said about you so you don't have to yourself. And so... Yeah. so does he know about this one rumor? Maybe, maybe not. But I guarantee he's heard kind of what said, hey, he might not be the first receiver taken. It might be Malik Neighbors. Hey, he right. might, you know, teams might feel a type of way about him not testing. And maybe that hurts his draft stock. Maybe it doesn't. I'm sure that he's in tune with what's going on, though, uh, given the conversation around him right now, given what he didn't do. Um and he's, I mean, he's still met with teams, though. Like, he may not have done any of the workouts during the pre-draft process, but he's still on visits with teams to, to find out if it's going to be a good fit both ways for the team and for the player. Yeah. And I think to, to write like why he may do something like this, the money aspect, I think that's a great way to bring it up, right? Like the wage scale, if this were something that he's, that Marvin Harrison is doing, I guess, right. Maybe because he's Marvin Harrison jr. You're not as worried about the financials that come along with it. You mm-hmm. still want to make as much money as possible, but maybe you're just not like the financials. You would rather be in a great situation. Sure. You're still talking about going out there to be with Kyler Murray, who, listen, has his issues, but can play the quarterback position, can throw the football and can get it to you. At at five, right, it, you're, you're talking about uh, uh, the Chargers. Uh, so you got Justin Herbert. Who wouldn't love to play quarterback with Justin Herbert? I guess when you get to the Giants, if he mm-hmm. were to fall there, there'd be some concern because you got Daniel Jones there. But you, then you get Tennessee, Atlanta, and Chicago, three teams that are expected to have young quarterbacks and or somebody established. So I guess if he was to do that, maybe he's thinking, I would rather get to a situation where somebody who's in a better spot wants to trade for me. But we're talking about the Chargers being the team trading. Yeah. So... Why wouldn't he want to go to the Chargers with Jim Harbaugh where you're starting at new? You've got the quarterback. You've got things already established. Mm-hmm. And like, I just, it seems like there's a lot of hurdles to jump for him to just say, I want to go to the Bears. And that is the one thing that apparently is the definitive, I guess, is as close to the definitive we can get is that Marvin Harrison is doing this because he wants to play for the Chicago Bears which means that he's hoping to get to a range where the Bears will trade up. Then comes in the question, are the Bears even willing to trade up to go get him if he falls to a certain point? Because that would end up taking, like, again, that's why I say I think it's going to be a trade back because they don't have a lot of draft capital this year. If this was a year where they had seven or even eight picks going in, that might be a different situation. But given the number of picks they have, given where they're drafting in the first round, given the receiver class and that you can get a high end receiver later in the first round, beyond the top 10, beyond the top nine, where they currently are with twice. um, It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me to go tap into 2025 draft capital. Cause that, if you're moving up to five, Pat, that's what it's going to take. Like you're going to have to give up nine and probably that 2025 second rounder from Carolina. Yeah. The Panthers um, pick. Yeah. You know, to, to move up. I just don't think that that's a realistic a realistic thing that Ryan Poles would do knowing that there are still holes on the roster and there's three positions of need. Like you think about quarterbacks already solved. Remember last week and the last couple of weeks we've been talking about how they were going to break off into pods and they had three positions they were talking about, offensive tackle, defensive end, or, you know, pass rusher, just group all them together and then wide receiver. Well, they have three picks. It's not just like, oh, these are p- positions that could be in play at number nine. They've got... Three picks and three pretty considerable positions of need. Some more than the, some are more immediate needs than others, but there's still three picks right there that they need to use to go handle fixing those holes that they still have, whether in a starter's role or whether for depth. So 
I don't, I don't view it as a, a situation where a trade up feels all that likely, just given what you'd have to get to do, what you'd have to do to get up there to five. When, or to when you start to, when you start to look at two, right? Like I think I'm not saying that there's no chance that the bears could trade that second round pick next season. I think though, you start to ask yourself, okay, are we? Is it more realistic to say that they would move that pick packaged with something to try and get back in the second round? Remember, nine to seventy-five, long, long way. A lot of players coming off the board. Ryan Poles does not like to sit on his hands during a draft. I think it would be more logical to what we've seen Ryan Poles do to say he would give up some of the future capital to get back into that second round to try and add more pieces that are coming there because it's going to cost you less over trading nine and two, which I don't, I don't even know. Like that sounded good in the beginning, but now you kind of look at that chargers room and it's like, it may cost more than that that's, to that's move up there because there's either. not, you know what I mean? There's not a lot of wide receivers in that room. You got Quentin Johnston. Who's got a huge question mark on his name. Keenan Allen's here. Mm -hmm. Right. Mike Williams is gone. So like you, you've got to start rebuilding out that offense. It's probably going to cost you a little more than just nine and mm -hmm. two. But I know that that was something that was being reported earlier when we were talking about the Bears trading up as well. And we can't forget who's before them at four. Like Arizona yeah. has multiple first round picks right now. They've got their like the Vikings, the Bears and Arizona each have two first round picks. If Arizona's yep. comfortable moving out of four, then that's Minnesota probably coming up to go get JJ McCarthy or get whichever quarterback. Um, right. Because it feels like it changes every single day based on things you're hearing <laughs> at this time of year. But when then, does Bo Nick get up there? <laughs> th then, like, if that happens, though, then the Chargers are staying there at five because no, like, if four quarterbacks are gone, then they get their pick of the best receiver available. And why wouldn't you? If you believe that that's Malik Neighbors, if you believe it's Marvin Harrison Jr., given the depth chart you just listed for us, yeah. and, and a lot of these things they had to do based on their salary cap constraints. They were able to yeah, restructure yeah. two defensive players contracts in Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa. And then they had to, they, you know, they cut Mike Williams and then they moved on from Keenan Allen. So I don't think it's a situation where they would be wanting to move out of five if they had their pick of every skill player in the draft, starting with them. I, I guess here's the other scenario, right? Maybe they believe neighbors is the number one. Mm -hmm. If it gets right, if it starts to get closer to you, do you think you could see the bears making any kind of move up where maybe it's not going to cost you that future second, but maybe like a fourth or a fifth, right? Is Marvin here. If, if you like get to a point where like, in the first it, round, like you're saying between, all right, let, let's, you're saying five is Marvin Harrison Jr. Or five is the Chargers. Malik, Malik, Neighbor. there. Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr. So you're saying basically between six and nine? Six, seven, six between six and eight, right? Because I don't think I they don't would know. worry about that because they've done their homework on the top three. And yeah. if, if they believe, like, the only thing I could imagine, and I don't think this is receiver driven, I think that if they felt that Joe Alt, if they were so Ooh, in love with yeah. Joe Alt, that he, and thinking like, my goodness, this guy is a 10 year left tackle for us. We would need to get ahead of Tennessee. If there is a trade up, I think that that would be the only Ooh. way that that happens. Because at nine, if it falls the way that we're talking about right now, they will have the third best receiver. If MHJ is gone at five. If the Giants right. take Malik Neighbors, or if that order is switched, then they then they'll have Roma Dunze there at nine. I don't think that they would feel compelled. Oh God, we've got to get ahead of um, of of uh, Tennessee right now to get a receiver. It'd be let's get ahead of Tennessee to go get this tackle. But I, I just don't I see. I, don't, I mean, that's only a couple spots, and no, that would yes. still be pretty expensive. That wouldn't. I that would. I think if you're moving up into the top five, top six of the draft order, you're probably giving up a pick next year too. Mm. Well, yeah, I was just saying like, maybe you're talking, you know, you get a, a, a fourth round pick instead of that Panther second. That Panther second is ridiculously. So it's going to be a really good valuable. pick for them because that's going to be like, very early 30s. <laughs> if this team is as bad as we think they have the potential that, to be this year. Yeah. I, I don't think that they're fixing a lot of, a lot of holes on that team in this one draft. Sure. I think they're going to, 
it's going to be tough for them. But uh, I, I think what also makes this interesting, and you said this, right, that you can still get the third best wide receiver. Let's jump into uh, our road to the draft brought to you by Toyota. Toyota, let's go places. Let's jump into Matt Miller's comparison player comparison list. He, he did his top uh, 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 2024 NFL draft rankings of the 474 prospects in this draft, and he's got comps for each and every one of them. Of course, Caleb Williams at one uh, will break him down, but I thought it was very interesting because you said the third best receiver in this draft would be somebody that would probably be, in this scenario, available to the Chicago Bears, and that's Roma Dunze. Mm -hmm. And when he talked about Roma Dunze, we've talked about trading back a ton. But the name that he compared him to was Jamar Chase, somebody who sat out their final year in college because of the COVID-19 thing and everything that was going on with that and still was the number one wide receiver, the number one pick yeah. taken off of the board. And uh, what he had to say about him was he's aggressive. Uh, aggressive might be the best word to describe a Dunze's game. Powerful before and after the catch. Beats up cornerbacks with his frame, physicality, and his dominant 2023 season. Dunze posted 92 catches for 1,640 yards, 13 touchdowns. NFL teams hoping to emulate the 49ers and load up on physical, powerful wide receivers will love his game and his tape. Uh, his tape is that of a rookie star with high end potential. He's 6'3, 212 pounds. When we say he's the third best receiver in the draft, it's because the other two are projected to be receivers we talk about 30 years from now yeah. with some of the greatest ever. He's still really good, and I love this comparison of Jamar Chase. I mean, you'd be thrilled if if this ends up panning out. Jamar Chase had a hundred catches last year, three you know three years in. The reason that the Bengals ended up getting to the Super Bowl in his first season when he was a top five draft pick, and you have to go back and look at these numbers. It is crazy to think how many receivers drafted drafted in the top ten of the draft order have made it to the receiver excuse me, have made it to the Super Bowl, like, ever. And he made it within his first year of being there in 2021. Like, it is yeah. wild to think about, like, how big of a game breaker this this guy is. And that term, game breaker, has been used for Malik Neighbors, for Marvin Harrison Jr., for Roma Dunze, and for good reason. Because these are the type of receivers where if you don't have your defense, like, knowing where they are at all times – then, then you're in a bad spot because that means that that guy is going to get open and he's going to be the threat for your quarterback that can help, you know, either the rookie development or can be the person to help take your quarterback to the next level. And I think that everything that we've seen with um, with with Roma Dunze at Washington and what he was for Michael Penix Jr. This is a dream for a young quarterback. This is a dream for Caleb Williams to go into a receiver room that is already established with a 27-year-old wide receiver in DJ Moore, which it was just his birthday the other day. So happy birthday to him. He's 27. So he's kind of at the middle part of his career. Keenan Allen's at nearing the end. And he still has several years he wants to play. But then you'd have a young guy coming in who projects now for the future of, of that position. Like that's, a Bears fan should hear that, and that is music to their ears. And I'm trying to find this stat that I had on on Roma Dunze himself. And let me I pull it up right here because it was just it was something that kind of like I I didn't really realize this until I started like going back looking at the um you know looking at like the top receivers, the numbers, and everything else. So over the last two seasons, he's one yeah. of two college wide receivers, FBS receivers to produce at least 2,400 receiving yards and 20 touchdowns. Like two did that period. You know who the other person was? It was Marvin Harrison Jr. So you might get the, the like in any other year where this isn't as stacked of a receiver class, this guy might be the first receiver taken. Yes. That's what like is the bottom line here. If you didn't have a group where I know I brought up field Yates's mock draft that we talked about last week, right? That was one where we saw 14 receivers taken in the first two rounds if this was last year's receivers class, if this was 2022, Roma Dunze is the first guy taken off the board, hands yeah. down. And that production is consistent. When you can see production like that, not just one year, that's two years of work right there that he put in at Washington that has him as a top 10 pick. 
that's a very good sign for the Bears, which is also the reason why I don't believe that they're going to go move up for a guy when they could get just as good of value. Somebody who they've done a lot of research on, just like the other two, but then they won't have to give up another pick that they could go use next year on another position that might come up that might be a position of need when they can handle it right now with somebody who's going to be equally as good, if not better. Who knows how that pans out? No, I it, and I think seeing this, of course, I've been watching the tape on some of these guys and seeing what they do, but it really does you forget how aggressive Jamar Chase is, like how much he uses his hands getting off of the line, how much he attacks DBs. That's something the Bears just haven't had in a while. I mean, Brandon Marshall? Like somebody who's just aggressive with everything that they do, get out and they and they just go up and are able to make a play. And you see that so often with Roma Dunze. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited uh, uh, at the opportunity to get him because it's like you said, any other draft year outside of maybe right where Jamar Chase is, Jamar Chase might be one of those guys that like, no matter what year it is, he's going number one, but he, it, it feels wrong to get him at nine. Like it really, it feels like, oh, like we're getting this dude as a steal, even well, though you're really not. Well, this happens, like it happened in 2020 when Justin Jefferson, who is a top three receiver in the NFL right now, fell all the way to 21, 22, yeah. wherever it was for the Minnesota Vikings. Like, when you have depth like this, you you know that like there's really no harm in staying where you are because, and I think we've seen this in a couple mocks. You and I, or maybe it wasn't a mock. It was the fact that it raised some eyebrows when the week that they were doing all of the big, or no, the week after they did all of the big name prospects coming in for, or at least the ones who started the top 30. So Caleb Williams, Dallas Turner, Roman right, Dunes. Yeah, yeah. Then we heard Xavier Worthy, and that was like the the first of the quote unquote second wave of wide receivers that are still first round talents getting taken. And you think, okay, that guy set a record for a 40 yard dash fastest since John Ross did it in 2011 um, at the combine. He is a speedy threat that can line up just about anywhere. He's a, you know, a really good receiver that you could get even in the twenties potentially, but they, They've given themselves options where they can either stay where they are or still get a similar caliber player later on. And not every draft gives you that sort of depth of talent across the board, which I think is a really good spot to be in. And they played it out well because I know that Ryan Poles has, has you know, one of the knocks on him, or I guess it would be a criticism, would be just about the two receivers that he has drafted in his yeah. first year, two, two years as general manager. Bayless Jones didn't work out. Tyler Scott may, but like, I mean, there were moments last year where it didn't, you know, guy was a fourth round pick. And I personally thought I was like, all right, if this is the ceiling, if this is what you saw from him in his first year as a fourth round pick, I mean, the only place to go is up. There weren't any moments. I mean, yeah, he, we don't have to go through like, you know, the Detroit game and, you know, the pass that he missed in the back of the end zone, I guess, was that Denver, whatever it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, there's growth and with, with time he will grow, but like now is your chance to get a home run hitter, a game breaker, somebody who comes in right away and changes the trajectory of what that room's going to look like. In addition to the two other top receivers that you have, it, they should be really excited about it because their end, their options feel kind of endless at the moment. And that's not bad when it all come, when it's all said and done. Yeah. And, and I think, for people that are going to go look at Matt Miller's list, it's, it's a really good list. Yeah, really no, good I, really, I like the way it. that he did this and kind of everybody see. doesn't get a great player. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I know a lot of times like people are like, oh, everybody's right. No, no, no. There's some names on this list where you're like, oh, that's who we're comparing them to. Mm -hmm. All right. There's some upside there. Yeah. I mean, like, I guess we got to figure out where the upside comes in, but it, you, we, we got some work to do on that. Right. But you brought up Xavier Worthy. He's comping him to Deshaun Jackson. Um, Lad McConkey, somebody who comes in after him, right? He's getting comped to Tyler Boyd. So, and of course, all of these aren't going to end up panning out, but I think it does go to show you that, right? D Jacks may have never been the best wide receiver in the NFL, but you could do a lot worse than Deshaun Jackson mm -hmm. if you if you had to figure out receivers on your team. And so, when you start to see it like that, right? That's a second round pick some of these guys may end up falling to the third round because of other players taken. It shows how deep this draft is and how many names actually are showing good NFL talent at the receiver position. Yeah. And that's, 
again, a great spot for them to be in and one that I think they can manipulate to to their benefit by either moving back and still getting a high caliber, high quality, high caliber receiver or staying at nine to get one and not feeling that they need to go move up in the draft order to get the guy that they covet. We got an interesting comp, which I think is more of an apt comp on our, our quarterback who we believe we're going to be mm-hmm. taking number one, Caleb Williams, got compared to Aaron Rodgers. He said that Williams is an elite prospect with upper level arm strength, running ability, field vision and poise. There are times when he forces some passes and he'll have to get the ball out faster in the NFL, but he has shown he can carry a team and create big plays with his second effort, mobility, diverse arm and arm talent, arm angles and arm talent. Uh, well, Williams finished 11th in QBR last season, 82.4, and threw for 3,633 yards, 30 touchdown passes, five interceptions. He is the overwhelming favorite to go first overall. I think the Rodgers comp, not to say that having Aaron Rodgers' expectations is not massively lofty expectations, mm-hmm. but I think that's more applicable to what we've seen out of Caleb Williams than the Patrick Mahomes comp. You hope that he can be Mahomes, but I think how Caleb plays and how he, you know, he'll step up in the pocket. He can use his arm. He can also use his mobility to extend the plays. That's a lot of what, as Chicago Bears fans, we've seen Aaron Rodgers do. Mm -hmm. That You got to pick your poison. You're going to blitz him or you're going to play zone. Either way, he can pick you apart. That's kind of what I think we saw from Caleb in college. Yeah, and... You know, the first thing that comes to mind when I read that, and I and I am glad that it wasn't the Patrick Mahomes comparison because not saying that that Rodgers hasn't had, you know, he's three-time MVP, he's won a Super yeah, Bowl. There's, there's pretty <laughs> really good comparison if you're a Bears fan hearing that. But, you know, the broken plays element, and I think about, you know, the times that you watch, or at least we saw it in Green Bay, when Aaron Rodgers, there'd be a broken, you know, broken down play, and he'd be scrambling around for eight seconds, buying time yes. to find somebody. That is a skill that so few quarterbacks can possess, the ability to get out of the pocket, and while you're on the, when you're, when you're processing what's happening downfield, when you're trying to, when you're moving, and you're trying to figure out where other people are moving to, to still make a throw that ends up in a completion that ends up in a big gain for your team. If, if he can do that. And what we've seen when, when we, when people have mentioned the backyard football comment with Caleb Williams and just that that's his style of play to me, I know people immediately go to, go to Patrick Mahomes. My, I go to Aaron Rodgers with a lot of that. Of course, Aaron Rodgers has a tremendous arm, whether he's in the pocket or whether he's outside of it pulling a Houdini act. But that is something that he has perfected as one of the best in the NFL over the last decade plus to do that. If Caleb Williams can come anywhere close, if that's his ceiling, if that's his player comp, then he's going to be a damn good quarterback for the Chicago Bears. Yeah, and I just I remember all those plays where right you think you've got Rodgers locked up, you're you're right mm-hmm. there on him, and he does that that little like step back where all of a sudden he's got an extra second. Then you think you got him again. He steps up and it's a hail mary pass. He's got a receiver wide open downfield. Like with, seeing those names together, I think that it's it. You almost forget that Aaron Rodgers was kind of like that. Like not that he was a mobile well I guess he kind of he was a mobile quarterback right yeah, like he, he was a guy that if he pocket, needed to. like no yeah. that's like him and Russell Wilson like Russ in his prime and Aaron Rodgers I think were the best at that and I mean Mahomes is in his own category so I, I just try not to like put him into any sort of comparison here because I just think it's it's the guy's won three Super Bowls in 2018 <laughs> like he's, an, he's a unicorn five. but yeah, I mean. um no I mean it's Rodgers Rogers was one of the best at that, and we'll see if he's able to be that coming off an Achilles tear. But I think that's a very, very astute observation um, that Matt Miller used here to try to compare the two. What I will be curious about is all the intangible stuff, too. Like, can he – intangible. Like, let's see how good Caleb Williams is at drawing defenders offside using the hard count. That is, like, when people think about Aaron – when I think about Aaron Rodgers – that oh, yeah. it's the stuff we just mentioned but it's that thing on third down when he's when he's drawing your defense offside because he like is an expert at getting guys to fall for that and bite on it that is those are the things that make quarterbacks like that those are the traits and, and qualities that make quarterbacks like better than others and and it's the the utilizing of the free play right that goes oh, God, into the yeah. system we saw 
uh, um, them doing that a little bit with Justin last season where actually we actually we saw it a lot more, right? They end up getting a touchdown off yeah, of that. Yeah, in the Detroit but game. In the Detroit game. So you 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 want to continue to see that, right? Like it was the combination of the scheme along with the QB. I just hearing that, right, as somebody who has my entire life has been ruled with like the the little bit of the Lovey Smith era until Rodgers showed up and then just Aaron Rodgers, the rest of it. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, let, let me get a little bit of payback with somebody similar. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I mean, we can go out there and beat the Jets. Was there anybody who was on this list that is, I guess, somewhat attached to the Bears they could trade back for more take at nine that you looked at and you were like, that's the kind of player, that's the kind of comp that if he is that, you can't let that guy get past you. I mean, like Dallas Turner, you know, if he's there at nine, if, if assuming Atlanta, if Atlanta doesn't take him at eight, the comp right. here is Josh Allen, the Josh Allen who just got paid in Jacksonville. Um, yeah. You know, like to have a force like that coming off the edge to put, you know, and, and what, you know, with Dallas Turner, how he projects size wise too. What do the Bears always talk about? Like the length, the the physical attributes, the athleticism. They've got like three boxes they want to check. And he's six three, so he's not the tallest. I mean, when you take a look at like Montez Sweat and what he looks like, you know, <laughs> he's six three, two forty seven. Like he can be a lot of different things for you. If you you could put him as an outside linebacker in certain schemes, you can have him as a as a you know edge rusher where he's got his hand in the dirt. That versatility is something I think Matt Eberflus, now that we've got a year of him calling the plays in Chicago and seeing what he wants to tinker with with this defense and how he wants to line guys up, like hearing that that, like that Josh Allen, you know, one of the better, like just hit, you know, second contract starting to hit that prime for pass rushers at age 26, 27, 28. Like yeah. hearing that as a comp, who like, you know, and I, I, I waffle on this every single day. We've got our, ESPN NFL Nation mock draft on Friday, which then airs, I believe, next Tuesday, Tuesday before the draft. And I'm really curious to see how this board falls because if Dallas Turner's sitting there at nine, I think I'm going to have a really hard time not picking him. If, and I think that the Bears would, if they stay at nine, if it's Roma Dunze or if it's Dallas Turner, what's the more immediate need? What's the, what's the, basically, you got to ask yourself, what's the position you think between those two specifically that you could get at a later, a later pick and still be okay yeah. with. And I just, I don't know if there's an edge rusher that, that would be available. Like if, if they, if they aren't able to move back and if they're just staying there and they've got 75, then like, do you have a starting defensive end there? Are you comfortable if you had to go get a defensive end in the third round that that guy's going to be able to be an immediate contributor to your team this year? I don't right. know, but that's one where I was like, damn, okay. The bears would be, Think they, I think they would like seeing that comparison if that's the player that they ended up going with. What always it's so tough to me because I, I just have a full on belief that some teams are really, really good at figuring things out. Right, like I have concerns with Philly on the fact that you know Jason Kelsey just retired, but Philly's got like six centers in a row. You know what I mean? Like they just they're really good at finding mm -hmm. that position and, and coaching so like, them too i mean coaching and, certainly and helps coaching. Like when you bring somebody in and you can expect that i mean hell that's a reason chris morgan was retained on this staff and given a promotion with the the run game coordinator stuff that he's going to be doing this year because of how they believe he develops offensive linemen um yes same thing. and i think that's that's the part for me where it's like is it more important to go get Dallas Turner? I would say positionally, yes. It's it's more important for you to have somebody opposite Montez Sweat than it is for you to have a third wide receiver in years that we're seeing now where you're getting receivers every year. But I also believe that the Bears, we, we've never talked about them struggling to find guys coming off of the edge. No. We've never talked about well, them as a couple team. of years. I mean, guys that they've drafted have not necessarily panned well, out. They, that. Yeah, yeah, they they got a little cute with Dominique Robinson. Are we done with that, by the way? Is that experiment over with? Like, is I mean, that... he was inactive for a bunch of games last year, <laughs> and I don't know for a fifth round pick. I, not that I'm projecting out my depth. I got to wait to see what the what the what the ninety man looks like going into training camp. But yeah. if they do go get 
an, an edge at nine. I think that that his days are numbered at that point. Yeah, it's it's it was it was a fun experiment. I like that we thought. Yeah, that it was converted going to wide work. receivers to defensive ends. They happen all the time. <laughs> He had he had one game, one game, that San Francisco game where he figured out what Trent Williams was doing. And then he told the world and nobody <laughs> and, and we never heard from him again. So um, but no, I just I, I feel like an investment in receiver is something that we don't find, especially under Ryan Poles, enough mm-hmm. versus especially with next year coming up as well, I think that we'd be able to find an edge. Or, of course, how Ryan Poles has done it, maybe he'd end up trading for one that's already established in the league. Like, I, I think that there's some options there. But I thought that Matt's list was really good. Some really good comps on there. Y'all know I was looking at that Jackson Powers Johnson one. Everybody gets me in the comments for that, Courtney. They're like, this guy loves centers. It, well, yes, I mean, yes. You can't hurt because they haven't, like had a good, yeah, they haven't had a good situation at that position since Poles and his staff got here. So now that they have an option for it, potentially, maybe they go that route. But I don't know. I mean, if they move back. Frank Ragnow. Hey. It's comp Frank Ragnow. I mean, you know I mean? pretty, it's a pretty good comp. I just, I mean, when we think about if they really think Ryan Bates is that guy and they don't have to really go all in on True. that position right now, then maybe that's not the, it's further down the priority list. Yeah, 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 no, I that that I do believe. I don't know. It seems like the love of Ryan Bates is a lot higher than me. I'm just jaded by us, you know, turning guards into centers because it's worked so well here in our history. Most teams, yeah, most I mean. teams can't do it. You got to cross train guys, but most teams that should not be like your primary option for that position. Uh, I love Yurko. Yurko's like you could turn centers into guards. Stop turning guards into centers. It's not wrong. It's, like, it, it's easier to go the other way. It was like eh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna take your word for it. You're, you've been in the trenches. Let's finish it off here, Courtney. The Chicago Sky. We got to talk about something that is great here in Chicago that is already established. Mm-hmm. They've had an off season here. They bring in Teaspoon as their new head coach. You trade away Kalia Copper, which I was like flipping a table at. I was like, what are we doing right now? But it all comes together. Talk about a plan coming together. Yesterday, and what I would say is the probably the most hyped WNBA draft I've ever seen in my life um, with yeah. Caitlin Clark coming out, Andrew Reese coming out, Chicago, Chicago Sky, I got to get to him. Go out and get Camila Cardozo and Angel Reese. The Twin Towers are in Chicago. And uh, is it a little bit odd that the WNBA team realizes that height and scoring in the paint <laughs> are so important funny. versus the Bulls who are running out like seven point guards in this play-in game tomorrow? No one's going to be able to score on those two in the post, which is just insane to think about. I know how happy both of them were to find out. Like They had some heated battles. Yes. In SEC play, like God, we remember that game between LSU and South Carolina in the SEC championship, um, you know, or excuse me, the SEC tournament that ended up, you know, seeing a lot of players get uh, suspended or yeah. excuse me, ejected out of there. I think that was the final. Was that the final game of the regular season? Going, I think that was the last game of the season. Yeah, going into the SEC tournament. Either way, we've seen these two battle before, and they're both going to have to expand their game offensively, but the I mean, Angel Reese, like the the double-double she averaged for two straight years at LSU, 20 points, 10 re- over 10 rebounds a game. Like, I think it was Shanae Agumake who might have brought up the comparison or somebody on the set last night said, hey, is it okay if we refer to you? You know, everybody knows you as Bayou Barbie. Could you be the WNBA's Dennis Rodman? And I thought about that. I was like, my goodness, what a co- what, what a what a comparison. What like an... Yeah an identity to live up to. And it's such a cool time for women's basketball and to watch what that draft was like yesterday to see how many stars, like when they were all outside of the empire state building in the orange hoodie, the W hoodie, I I thought it was like, is this going to be the picture that we think of with that class? You know what I mean? Like the Oh three class when they're all in the NBA, when they're all wearing the oversized suits, (laughs) <laughs> like I think about that draft class and like, because there's so much star power that came out of college or even out of high school at that point into the NBA. And we know all of those guys, all of, most 90% of the players in that draft class went on to have incredible careers. Yeah. Some like LeBron who are still currently still playing. Um, 
could this be the draft class that does that in the WNBA? And I know that there's been debates about kind of like the old guard of the WNBA and the new players and how things should be prioritized and having to earn your stripes and all these things. But there's a debate now about the Olympic team. Could Caitlin Clark get onto the Olympic team? That would mean that a WNBA, a current WNBA player, a veteran would be left off. And I think we got to stop putting like, oh, well, you know, you got to earn it. So you got to earn it, of course. But like, I think that we need to stop, we need to stop doing, putting things on principle or start putting things on principle aside when it comes to somebody who's already done so much for the game of women's basketball. And if she is the one of the best, like don't let politics get involved in that and put her on that right. damn roster. Cause I would like to see the women take a home, a gold medal. And if that means Caitlin Clark's on that team, like, and if somebody else who has been in the WNBA for a while has to sit out, well, so what? That's competition. But no, I mean, back to the Chicago sky. I'm ex I'm excited for what this does for women's basketball in the city based on where this team was a couple years ago winning a championship, how far they fell under James Wade for him just like bolting out of here saying, I don't want to be a head coach anymore. Let me go be a bench coach for the Toronto Raptors. How'd that work out for you? Um I still, I don't appreciate the move. I understand the pressure that comes with being a head coach. Not everybody's meant for that, but you know, to watch. And he was head coach and GM. To watch, yeah, yeah. a lot of power with that. To watch what yeah. this team has become, but now kind of like the LA Sparks, a once, a once really proud franchise that fell by the wayside. They've got a coach out there that's trying to make that team better. They've got a coach here with Spoon who's trying to make that better for the Chicago Bull. Excuse me, the Chicago Sky. Um, if only the Bulls could get out of their own way and, and have oh, a draft that as good as the Sky does. But no, I mean, I'm pumped for it. I'm pumped to get, like, I'd love to get an Angel Reese jersey, um, Sky jersey, and it's going to be super clean. But think about what this means for, like, the greater city of Chicago and the sports landscape. Yeah. We've got Connor Bedard, who was number one overall pick in last year's NHL draft. We have Caleb Williams coming next week to be the number one overall pick here for the Chicago Bears two top seven picks for the three and seven for the Chicago sky with Camila Cardozo and Angel Reese. Like yep. this wave of young talent. I've been trying to rack my brain ab around this. When's the last time the city had this many star rookie players or players who are at the peak of their college career coming in here that already had the allure around them yeah. and obviously Connor Bedard not coming from college he's like you know barely 19 years old at this point but nonetheless young stars like this city has an influx of them right now it's an exciting time to be a Chicago sports fan and to get to cover the landscape knowing that these are the players that are going to take three teams that have had losing records some more frequent losing records than others and be responsible with getting these teams on track. That's a very, I can't think of any other city right now that has this much of a youth movement within yeah. like the entire sports landscape. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And listen, the Reinsdorf's got to figure it out. <laughs> like, like that's, that's really what it comes to. You're getting left behind brother. The white Sox on the two wins. You pieces. of it. Listen, I don't even get me started on what's going on on the other side of the bulls. The bulls are a team that, uh, they're, they're, tw uh, 26th in three-point shooting, 21st in points in the paint, so they don't shoot the three or go into the hole. Um, <laughs> and, and they've got a 114 offensive rating and a 2024 20, modern NBA. Like they, And they're running out four-point guards. Like Some of these teams got it together, but but I think not I love the, the point... Not, not the Bulls. I love the point that, that you bring out about the Chicago sports landscape, though, because... And even even bigger, right? When you talk about stars here, like I think we got two stars in the draft yesterday. But for the WNBA, I view this kind of like the the eighty four draft. Not to say that there wasn't a ton of talent in the WNBA before, but it feels like there is this massive influx of talent that is about to raise the playing level of everybody in that league because they're all. I mean, like. I looked at that entire first round yesterday. I'm like, there's a lot of players that are going to be really, yeah. really good for years to come here. And people are going to be talking about, oh, well, who went 15th? Who went 18th? Isn't you know, so like, I mean, Rakia Jackson, I think, is a prime example of that from Tennessee. I remember <laughs> talking to her after Tennessee won its first game in the NCAA tournament and just kind of going over her accomplishments. And I'm like, 
you know, this is a bit like I, I get we had her on radio that day. And I remember yeah. thinking, you know, we talk so much about, you know, uh, about, you know, Caitlin Clark, about Angel Reese, about Camilla Cardozo, about Cameron Brink. But like you're a baller, too. And she like the offense, the offense that comes through that person, like what it did for Tennessee what it's done for SEC basketball and to watch all of these people who are responsible now for carrying the momentum that they've gained in women's college basketball over into the WNBA, which has a season that starts in less than a month. And yeah. it's a season that goes on at a period where the sports calendar is more quiet. This is a prime opportunity to capitalize on an audience that you built. These girls are responsible for building the audience that watched 18 million people watching that final game against South Carolina yeah. and Iowa. They did that. That was not fake. They did that. And now it's on them. Like, I feel like just hearing the way that each of them talked about being proud of their efforts and being proud of one another last night when they were doing their interviews after being drafted um, for what they've accomplished in the women, game of women's college basketball. You know, you can go like one through 15. You're right. It's not just Sabrina Ionescu at the top of the WNBA draft. It's not, just taking a look at players who go like one, two, and three. And then you're like, okay, yeah. I've never heard of this player. I don't know her game. I'm not familiar with it. Like you're familiar with the depth of this draft, which is awesome. And I'm excited. Women's basketball is in a really good place. WNBA draft, they crushed it um, with the way that it was presented. And, and I think even hearing Kathy Engelbert, the um, commissioner of the league, talking about how ESPN, like kind of the partnership that they've had in – expanding the game of women's college of women's college hoops, but also with the WNBA, this is going to be a really big window that the sport has to capitalize on to make sure that this Absolutely. momentum continues. Absolutely. Do not let it die. Sky season tickets are already sold out. I'm tickets are tickets are higher than I think they've ever been. I mean, like I looked at the, uh, the, for the nosebleeds, the Kate, the um, Iowa fever, Chicago sky game is, $349 for the nosebleed seats. Just wow. to put that into perspective, and guess, and li yes, the, the sky were very bad last season. But to put that into perspective, I could have paid $349 last season to almost sit courtside. Like, that is the difference in mm -hmm. what these names are doing to the game. Uh, I know Caitlin Clark, I think when they go out to Vegas, they've got yep. like they moved it. a football stadium rented out, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so. It, it's it's massive. It's the biggest it's ever been. I love it because as somebody who has a daughter, I, I've always enjoyed the WNBA game, but now it's like having her have somebody that she can look at and say, oh, I can play like yeah. her. I can, I look like her. I, I can be on the court like her. Now listen, if she gets to six, seven, yeah, I mean, I'm packing my bag. She's say, going you, to leave. You can retire at that point. <laughs> <I'm calling bigger. laughs> but I just I, I I think that where women's sports is at, especially the WNBA right now, is so cool. And it finally feels like because in other countries it is massive. In other countries, there is a following. There is a a love of their women's basketball. I finally feel like that was felt yesterday. Yeah. With the WNBA draft and not just the college game. Yeah, no, it was really neat. And I'm 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 eager to see, you know, this. I don't know if there's there's not another draft where the college season ends as quickly as the women's college season ended, where those those players that are drafted right away. College football ends in December for most players. Um, How's baseball? baseball oh, sort of because kinda. like it's like well, during the season almost. Ain't it's it? co college World Series ends by the time I want to say like I think. The, the draft happens in like for most players in the middle of that. So, yeah. Um, but then again, like those players though, aren't going right to ma the majors. They're going minor leagues, wherever, whichever yeah. level of minor league baseball they, they have to start out at. Like it's just different to where Caitlin and I, and of course the roster limits in the WNBA oftentimes prevent players who were drafted from making teams like right away, which is crazy to think about, but yeah. there's going to be a lot more competition. There's going to be a lot more talent. And I think no matter what's been said uh, in, in co comments that have been taken out of context, like what Diana Taurasi said that reality is coming, like, you know, that will be true for some, but by and large, the, the girls that are coming in, the women that are coming in right now are, are going to be the ones who change the game and make it a more, 
more tangible product for most people to consume. Hey, listen, the, the, Tarasi meant what she said. She, she, we like know she, what time back. she's on. You know she's gonna be trying to run through Caitlin Clark. Like Tarasi didn't got a little. She, she a little jaded in her later years in this league. She's like, she got a little too aggressive. I don't know. I ever since Sky played her, I've been like, you, you still a goat. But you, you're a little too cocky for me. Come, hey, come back to earth. You lost. Yeah, you know I mean that's all I'm saying. Um, but no, I. I think that uh, women's sports is in a great game. I think Chicago sports is in a great place um, with all the stars that we have coming here. Once again, Jerry, wake up. I don't know. Maybe you're taking a nap. Is MASH on? Maybe you got a little mat lock going. Maybe cut that off. Pay attention to the fact that you have two of the most middling. I, I, well, I can't say two. One of the most middling teams in Chicago sports with the Chicago Bulls and uh, one of the worst teams I've ever seen in my entire life in the uh, Chicago White Sox. So, uh Tough. Uh, yeah, you know I mean, wake up a little bit. Uh, but for Courtney Cronin, I'm Pat the Designer. Appreciate you guys tuning in and rocking with us for another episode. Hit that like button, subscribe to the page, lead a five star review. Y'all know what to do. So much more coming your way. As always, it's your boy Pat the Designer. Y'all stay safe out there, Chicago. One love, bear down. Peace.